The first thing we're going to do today is clean up our parser from yesterday. We can start by replacing our many one here with set by one, which is a parser combinator that takes in two parsers as parameters. The first is the parser that we are interested in, and the second is the character that separates those. And that will then parse many of those fields separated by that other character. I, I think it should be called in an infix way to make it work. So it's parsing many fields separated by a carriage return. We also need to make sure that we're parsing the whole input. So we use less than star EOF to ensure that we are followed by an EOF. However, the less than star means we throw away the EOF result and just return the result of the left hand side. I'm going to up the ante a little bit now and generalize this field type parser to be able to parse any enumeration. I'd like to be able to parse case insensitive strings and match them against the enumeration constructor names. So I'm going to create a parser that can parse a, a character in a case insensitive way. And we do that by using one of and then the data.char functions to lower and to upper to ensure we're matching one of those cases. We can then use that to create a case insensitive string parser by simply using mapm on our char parser. Now this mapm function is quite interesting because it allows us to take a function from A to something B and a list of A's and convert that to a something of list of B's. And that something in our case is a parser, but it works just the same for a maybe type. So let's say we have a list of maybe ints. We can use mapm and then just the id function to then create a maybe list of ints. In the maybe case, it will just uh, give us nothing if any of them are nothing, or a just value if they're all just values. And in the parser case, it actually just combines those parsers by sequencing them one after the other. Okay, so after importing data.char, this works as expected. Now we're ready to create our enumeration parser. And we're going to base this on the field type parser. So we're going to choose between a list of the values, except this time we're going to create the list by mapping our SR function across the whole range of our enumeration. Unfortunately, that dot dot syntax is not valid Haskell, but we'll deal with that in a second. Okay, so we change our SR function to take in any showable value and create a parser for it. And we're going to parse in a case insensitive way. So we need to work out a way to cover the range of values in our enumeration. Unfortunately, Haskell has a type class called bounded, and that provides us a min bound and a max bound for any type. And then the field type is just enump, but this still doesn't work for a few reasons we haven't given the type of min bound and max bound, but using a type variable within the scope of a function requires us to use this for all notation and the scoped type variables language extension to GHC. Now we just need to make sure our enumeration has the bounded and enum type classes by adding them to the deriving clause. Now field type doesn't need to be its own function, so we can just use enump directly in our field parser. Let's take those functions out and put them into our AOC Haskell file. We need to put the language extension at the top, the import at, with the other imports, and our functions can go alongside our parse function. The last thing to note for part one is that instead of length, we should have used map size here because that is a more efficient operation because length will actually traverse through the map to count the elements. Now I've applied all those same changes to part one that we did already. And we're going to look now at the height parser. And I'm going to show you how you can condense a do notation into an expression. 
Now firstly, I hope you understand that you can take the readout here and use fmap to read in the value directly into h. Now that we have just a simple return type, we can use a tuple section with fmap and apply to bring in those values. And we have then the equivalent function. If you haven't seen them before, tuple sections are just a function that allows us to construct a tuple. So let's move on to day five. And we have this really long, complicated explanation of essentially how binary numbers work. So our task is just to read in each of these letters and interpret that in the correct way as a binary number. So let's get our input. And we have a quick look at it and we see that we've just got these letters and each of those is a zero or a one in our binary number. So we're gonna use our interact function again, which remember pulls in everything line by line. So we're gonna map our function f over each of those lines, and that's in turn gonna map a function bin over each character in the line. And we're going to interpret each of the characters in the appropriate way as a zero or a one in our binary number. Once we've done that, we need some way to combine those to get our integer at the end. So we're gonna use a function called fold, and a particular type of fold called fold or dash. And this is a left fold, and the dash here means it's a variant of fold which uses strict evaluation. We're going to fold by taking the number we have already, that's the x, and then the next number we add is the y. So we need to multiply the existing number we have by two, and then add the next digit y. Uh, the zero is the initial value for x. And this then steps through the list and brings in all of the values by putting them through that accumulating function. Fold is defined in data.list, so we need to make sure we import that. And we can see now then we've read in all of the numbers as integers. Now we just simply have to find the maximum. All right, let's check our answer. And we have our first gold star for today. Nice and simple. All right, part two is a little bit more complicated and we need to find the missing value. I'm sure there's some really easy way to do this that I just can't think of right now, but the way I'm thinking of is to create a combination of the list and its tail. And we're going to use a function called zip to do this. Okay, so we just uh, read in the file that we had from before. And the first thing we're going to do is actually sort the list. Let's have a look at our sorted list. And we, yeah, have a bunch of numbers in order. We're going to use a function called g then. And g is going to, to start with, it's just going to zip the list with its tail. We're then going to use a list comprehension to extract out each of the elements of the original list with its following element, and we're gonna call those x and y. And then all we need to do is check for which pair of values x plus one is not equal to y. Another way to say x plus one is simply suck x or successor of x. And that returns us the only tuple where y is two greater than x. We can then simply return the successor of x, because that will be the element in the middle. And now we should be able to check our answer, and we have our second gold star for today. Before I go, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to RS232boy, who sent me this amazing solution to the last puzzle. It uses the split function from data.string.util instead of using parsers, and I think the solution is quite elegant and nice. So until next time, happy Haskelling.